This is the closest, most intimate look you'll likely get of an outlaw biker meth lab. Unless, of course, you're that kind of biker, a cop, or have experienced meth chef on your resume. For the rest of us, we have this. A walkthrough of a large clandestine methamphetamine lab recently uncovered in Australia after a wild police chase where the suspects rammed police cars trying to escape. The Mob Reporter here with news of a major development in a long-running investigation targeting Australia's outlaw biker clubs that not only turned up this robust meth lab, it found a distribution alliance between two biker clubs that were once trying to kill each other and ties to a brash biker boss living in exile in the Middle East in apparent fear of arrest in his homeland. Let me tell you about it. The place was a dump made for business, not for pleasure, and a dirty business at that. It was built on the bones of an old kitchen, robbing me of the chance to say police found everything but the kitchen sink inside. They were using an array of makeshift materials, blending kitchenware, hardware goods, industrial supplies, and some lab equipment, but precious little. When your product is dried beside a filthy toilet, you might think the manufacturers were callous about health and safety. The lab was in the Hinterlands, a rural, sparsely populated area called Mangrove Mountain, about 55 miles due north of Sydney, one of Australia's largest cities. A hazardous materials crew from the fire department took the first crack at the lab, making sure it was safe for investigators to enter. Everyone wore full protective gear inside. The various pots, buckets, tubs, kettles, jugs, bags and bottles of substances found inside were brought out one by one to figure out what it was, or what it was supposed to be at least, or what it was on its way to being. When it was identified, it was then weighed, analyzed and catalogued. Police still haven't figured everything out, but it is clear, police say, they were making meth, also called ice, on an industrial scale. Before police moved in on the lab, they had it under surveillance, day and night, both by officers hiding in the bush and using unspecified technology. Covert field officers lay covered in frost while secretly watching it through the night, an officer said. Police had been chasing drug shipments moving out of the area around Sydney to neighboring regions and states. It started coming together in June when police stopped an unregistered Mitsubishi SUV while it traveled on a highway midway between Sydney and Adelaide, two of Australia's major cities. Inside, the highway patrol found it was loaded with cocaine, meth and ecstasy, worth about 13 million Australian dollars by a police estimate. The 65-year-old driver was arrested. Detectives then executed a search warrant soon after and seized $450,000 in cash, electronics and more drugs. That's ice, cocaine, heroin and pot. That led investigators to form a special task force called Strike Force Garlow, which tracked down other targets. In July, a truck was intercepted on the M5, a highway in the southwest suburbs of Sydney. The driver fled across five lanes of traffic narrowly avoiding being squashed, but he survived and police found him hiding in the bushes nearby. When they searched him, police said, he had 280 grams of cocaine hidden in his pants. I can't understand him not tossing it while he was running. Inside the truck, officers say they found 17 kilos of coke and 8 kilos of meth. All in, it was worth about $9 million on the street, police estimate. Two men were arrested. One was linked to the seizure from the Mitsubishi the month before, which is probably why police targeted this truck for interception. Another police chase preceded the drug lab bust. It was another SUV, this time a black Toyota Kluger. That's a Toyota Highlander to everyone outside of Australia and Japan. It was in Urimba, a remote area about 50 miles north of downtown Sydney. It didn't go smoothly. The driver, police allege, rammed his Toyota into two police cars trying to stop him, injuring several of the detectives and heavily damaging one of the police cars before crashing itself into a gutter on the campus of the University of Newcastle, 
two men then bailed out. They didn't get far. Tracked by police dogs, two men were found not far away and arrested. One was 48 and the other 35. A search of a nearby home turned up drug paraphernalia, $220,000 cash, a stun gun, and a ballistic vest, police said. It was a couple of hours later when officers finally moved in on the drug lab on rural property in Colnera, about 15 miles inland from the crash site. There, investigators said they found 10 kilos of finished meth, a large quantity of methylamphetamine oil, more than 20 kilos of precursor chemicals, and equipment consistent with the large-scale manufacture of prohibited drugs. Much of what was being seized in trucks around the state, police say, was coming from the slab. Officers said those arrested were senior members of the group, including biker club office holders. But the network has not been decapitated. This lab wasn't an isolated creation. It was manufacturing meth under an apparent agreement between two homegrown biker clubs, the Comanchero Motorcycle Club and the Nomad Motorcycle Club. The two clubs had previously been rivals, firebombing and shooting at each other. But business makes strange bedfellows. They turned to larger scale domestic meth production when COVID lockdown interfered with importation, police said. In the words of Detective Superintendent Rob Critchlow, the lab and those who ran it are well connected with overseas criminal networks, substantial Australian criminals, with, quote, tendrils to the Middle East, unquote. It seems this is the tendril he means. Mark Buttle once a Comanchero national president, and now suspected of being a guiding influence for the club's high-level involvement in the international drug trade. Buttle has been the focus of intense police interest for years, so much so that he feels more comfortable living abroad. With many close associates and friends from the Comanchero being of Middle East descent, that's where he headed. For a while he was living in Dubai. According to a report in the Sydney Morning Herald, he recently relocated to Iraq, but is believed to again be on the move. That report says Buttle is one of 16 or so on Australia's priority organization target list. Even though he has left Australia, and apparently faces no international arrest warrant, police maintain keen interest in him. In fact, just hours after the clan lab was raided, officers swarmed Mark Buttle's family's homes and a business. In this case, those of his in-laws. In theory, it's a different probe, called Strike Force Gildy. It's been running for nearly a year and a half and targets the Comanchero Motorcycle Club. Police seized cash, documents, electronics, a set of handcuffs, biker gear, and other items that investigators said were, quote, relevant to ongoing investigations, unquote. Among the stuff taken was a diamond-encrusted gold ring in the shape of the 1% symbol. Many of you will know that bikers who declare themselves to be part of the outlaw biker culture have a 1% on their vests and often in tattoos and jewelry. The ring also says East in diamonds down the middle. It is believed to be Buttle's ring. The in-laws appear to be facing no charges, but only are collateral damage in the battle between the bikers and the police. The Comanchero are one of the most successful homegrown clubs in Australia. It was started in the mid-1960s by Jock Ross, a former soldier from Scotland. Its name came from an old western starring John Wayne. In the movie, the Comancheros are not the Comanche Indians of the Great Plains of American Southwest, as is widely thought, but a criminal gang who smuggled guns and whiskey and terrorized the frontier. We have a society here. A society that's different from anything visualized by people anywhere in the world. The industry of our society is crime. It pays, and we prosper. That seems more fitting. A split in the Comancheros in the 1980s led to a rebel faction patching over to become Australia's first chapter of the Banditos Motorcycle Club. The feud between the Comancheros and the Banditos galvanized public opinion when a public shootout killed six bikers and an innocent teenage girl. I tell that story of the Milpara Massacre in a video I link to here and in the description. 
Despite infighting and deadly rivalries with both the Hells Angels and the Banditos, the Comanchero have found friends and room to grow. The club has become a popular space for Middle Eastern members, especially immigrants from Lebanon, including its former president, Mahmoud Mikhawi. By the way, notice the ring that he's rocking. Look familiar? The story goes that Howie took control of the club from Jock after beating him up and taking the boss's colors in the early 2000s. The club was already heading in a different direction from Jock's vision, including ignoring Jock's ban on dealing or using hard drugs. While Howie was in prison for a notorious airport brawl that killed a Hells Angels associate, Buttle became the Comanchero's national president. He apparently no longer holds that title, but perhaps maintains its authority, or at least a considerable influence among members. Australian police are working with authorities in the Middle East, who, Critchlow said, have been, quote, remarkably helpful. That region, he said, is no longer a safe haven for them. We'll see how that goes. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe.